Well, happy Easter, Kings of Anglia family, dare I say. It's uh, Easter weekend, and uh, welcome to another Kings of Anglia podcast. I'm Mike Bacon, La Porca de la Porc. La Porc de la Cream Egg, actually, at this time of year, because I do like a cream egg. I don't know about you, one of my favourites. Um, I know Smarties are quite popular in our house, and also, um, and sometimes uh, Mars bars. You can still get little Mars bar Easter eggs. But anyway, cream eggs are my favourite. I'm Mike Bacon. i um, looking forward to having a little chat with you over this Easter holiday. I hope you bring a little fun to your uh, your Easter. The sun is shining. It looks like it's going to be a nice it's going to be a nice uh, weekend. And of course, wouldn't it be nice if Ipswich Town managed to get three points at Rotherham this weekend on Sky TV, where we always do so well. But we'll talk about that a little later. I'm joined by two, well, <laughs> two wonderful kings. I mean, I can't even start to tell you how wonderful they are. Um, the first one, of course, he'll be there. He'll be there. He'll be there at Rotherham. So look out for him. I mean, you know, a little pat on the head if you see him and say hello. You can give, 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 a, give a sausage roll. Give him a sausage roll because he's always a little bit peckish. So, and he could do, and he doesn't always eat a lot. So he could do, but he'll be there with his camera and his video. He'll be chatting to the fans and um, he'll chat to you out. Probably, he'll probably talk to you outside a hot dog store, which seems to be his new, the in on vogue sort of thing to do for uh, for vlogger, bloggers, whatever they call themselves. Um, it's a Roscoe Media UK at Roscoe Media UK, of course, if you want to contact him for any, well, I don't know what he does really. I dread to think what photos he takes. But anyway, he can contact him and, um, and he'll be there for, for all your, um, for all your photo needs, but it'll be at Rotherham. That's the main thing, because that's where we're all here to talk about. Uh, Roscoe, how are you this uh, this fine Easter? Well, it's Good Friday, Good Friday morning. Do you, do you, do you like Good Friday? Have you a hot cross bun? Have you had a hot cross bun this morning, uh, Roscoe? No, you... Not just yet. I've got one in the cupboard, though. I will, I will make one when we come off air. Um, but, Mike, by the way, have you had mm. a fresh trim, as the kids say? Ah, now it's very kind of you to notice, Roscoe. Very good. I have had a fresh trim. Yes, I did. I went to see went to see my um, barber, a uh, Ricky, Ricky, Ricky the barber. He's a, a nice lad. Does a very good job. Very good job. I'm always very pleased with his with his efforts. I'm very happy. Always. I even I even give him a tip. I even give him an extra little, little extra pound just to say thank you. But do you think I look smart? Makes me. Some people think I look um look even younger than I look, which is <laughs> extraordinary. I don't know how you can do. But anyway, thank you, Roscoe, for that. And see what I mean, people. He said he had one hot cross bun. That's all that boy's got. One hot cross bun. You see, I mean, I've got half a dozen, but he's only got one. Pass, give him a sausage roll. Get the boy a sausage roll. Anyway, my fellow king, another fellow king who joins me on this wonderful Good Friday morning where the sun is shining, as I said before. And it's, uh, well, it's always a little bit stand to attention when this man uh, is, uh, is is on the pod. I always have to because he can, he, he can bring me up on things and, and in case I get things wrong, which I often do. But he's the, he's the chief. He's not any chief. He is the chief, the chief football writer, chief among chiefs. If we had if we had a community of chiefs, he would be the chief. It's Stuart Dr. Watson, Watson, Watson. Wonderful. Looking absolutely wonderful. Having just enjoyed a thoroughly good game of golf the other week with myself in a team. We'll tell you about that a bit later. Looking forward to Rotherham tomorrow. Early start for us. Uh, I'm still actually going with you, which is fun. Um, how are you this uh, good Friday morning? Hello. <laughs> I'm good, thank you. Um, <laughs> looking forward to our little road trip. The three of us, no Andy this weekend, so it's me, you, Ross, leaving Ipswich at 7am. Thank you very much, Sky. Should be covering a game today, really, on Good Friday, shouldn't we? It doesn't feel quite the same Saturday, Tuesday over Easter, but there we go. Mm, absolutely right, Stu Pot. What a ridiculous time for a, for a kickoff at 12.30 on an Easter Saturday when we could all be playing this afternoon and we could all be eating Easter eggs tonight, Easter eggs all day tomorrow. Instead, we'll be travelling up the uh, A1. Well, that's the way I'm going to go. I don't know if it's the right way. I assume it probably is. Um, but uh, Rotherham, well, well, look, let's talk about the game. I mean, Ipswich Town, or Rotherham, we're still, um, of course, we can still make the playoffs. Uh, that brought a big silence. Yeah, anyway, so um, we can still make the play. No, maybe we can't. But anyway, Stu, let's talk about Rotherham. Um, well... I mean, I suppose if you're a Rotherham fan, you're starting to get a little bit sort of, um, well, what earth has happened? I think there's something like 20th in the league form table or something at this moment in time. Good chance for town to go there. Yeah. And then along come Ipswich. That's normally the script, isn't it? <laughs> it's Ipswich have got a number of things hanging over them. Um, one of which is they're the team you want to play when you're out of form. It's felt like that anyway. I don't know if I've got the stats to back that up. That's just a feeling that's over the years. Um, certainly the TV curse is, is one. Three wins in 34 games on television. That goes Since the Noel Hunt famous late winner against Charlton, that's the record. Played 34, won three, drawn 10, lost 21 games on TV with your Barrows and Lincolns and, oh. and games like that along the way. Um, so 
Yeah, in, in Ipswich fans' minds, I'm sure there'll be a few a few of those things. But if you're a Rotherham fan, you're right. You're 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 absolutely uh, going to this game with with huge trepidation. I would have thought because they lost three 0 at Portsmouth on Tuesday night. That's three straight defeats for them. They looked home and hosed what a month or two months ago in this league. We thought Rotherham are this League One winning machine. Um, and the wheels have rather come off for them now. They've slipped out of the, the top three, and they'll be they'll be really worried. I mean, I must confess, Rotherham were the one team. I don't know about you, Roscoe. The one team who were at the top there over Christmas. You thought, well, that's that's that one. That's one place secured for automatic. Um, it's case of who's scrapping for second. I, I'm stunned by their sub because they're a big, strong team. I'm stunned by their sudden drop. Yeah, when they came to our place and they cruised past us, you know, that 2 0 defeat, um, which is a standard when we play Rotherham. They normally come to our place and boss us. But um, yeah, I've been surprised to see their their terrible run of form. You know, three straight defeats. Only one win in the last seven games. You know, they're struggling to score goals. They've got a, a goal scorer on their side, Michael Smith, who scored 18 league goals. He hasn't scored since February. And that proves maybe another, another thing that you do need a striker scoring your goals. Um, but they've still got a good team. I still fear them. But um, they are a, a very surprise in terms of how much they're dropped off. Because, yeah, they were happy going to be playing championship football again. But it looks like they're going to be maybe trying to scratch into the automatics. I mean, that's interesting, isn't it, Stu? Because, you know, every t- teams have blips. Most teams have blips throughout a season. You don't go through a whole season unless you're my Woodbridge under-13s because we went through a season unbeaten. But that's a different thing altogether. But, I mean, no, you usually go through a season and you always have a blip. What an awful time for rather than this to suddenly happen. I mean, you'd have, you'd have, you'd have minded it at Christmas or November, but not a good time this for him, is it? No, um Kieran McKenna was very keen to say in his press conference that he's not reading too much into it. He said exactly that. Every team has a spell at some stage in the season. Hopefully we can prolong their spell. But he was very clear that he he went to Portsmouth. He was at Fratton Park on Tuesday night and said, despite the scoreline, that was a fine margins game where Rotherham actually started quite well. And had they got the first goal, that that game could have easily tipped in in their favour. And it sounds like they've had a few of those recently and you don't suddenly become a poor team overnight and as Ross says Ipswich have played Rotherham three times since relegation to League One and have been completely bossed in all three of those games they have been the benchmark for what it takes to get out of this division out out for out thought in in all three of those games big physical direct side um not just that, they can play a bit too. Dan Barlays are sitting at the base of the midfield, can spray an unbelievable range of passes, set pieces, um, which is something that Ipswich have, have obviously lacked. So um, you do worry that they might suddenly, uh, you know, that again, going back to what I said earlier, that uh, that they stop their, stop the rot when, when Ipswich come along on, on Saturday. But um, we'll see. You're not wrong, actually, Stu. I don't know. I feel I feel like that as well. And when you're quite correct, and then along came Ipswich. I mean, and and that is that does it feels that way. I mean, I'm sure statistically it probably isn't, but it just feels they're on this bad run, and some they're going to suddenly win again, aren't they, Rotherham? Maybe that's the natural kind of cynicism and pessimism that's inbuilt into all us, all of us as football fans. Probably football fans up and down the country feel like that, but. When I kind of spoke to Kieran McKenna in his press conference yesterday about the, the TV record that I've mentioned, he wasn't aware of it, but he sort of smiled and said, look, I'm, I'm aware that there are several things that have let... He's done a lot of research into what had led to Ipswich being in the place they're at and what had led to the crowds dwindling and the apathy building. And um, So he'll be, he'll be well aware that he used the phrase time to write some new scripts, time to change the narrative... Uh, and, you know, it's, it's the TV thing. It's the post-international break thing. It's not beating Norwich. It's going out of the cups at every hurdle. It's been all of those things have added layer upon layer to to the feeling surrounding Ipswich. And if McKenna can slowly start changing a few of those, and on Saturday, if he could, you know, a TV win would go some way to doing that. One of them was not winning in front of big crowds at Portman Road. Whenever they got a big crowd at Portman Road, Ipswich wouldn't win. Well, started to change that slightly beat beat Plymouth recently at home in front front of a bumper crowd um just slowly start changing a few of those little narratives and then it will feel like it which are pro- probably on the turn and going in the right direction again 
It's good points there, Ross, isn't it? I mean, that is absolutely right. What Stu said, he's got good stats, Stu Pot's got there, on Mr. Watts. He's, good. he's got some excellent stats. That's three and 34 and all this sort of stuff. Excellent stuff. And that's absolutely right, Ross. I mean, it is just these things that Stuart just mentioned. As a fan, you know, fans, they not beating Norwich, going out of cups. Da, 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 da. It's right, isn't it? it? That's one thing McKenna could do you know, above anything is just change that type of narrative, you know. Yeah, that, yeah, the TV curse is always when we always get picked for Sky. You go, oh God, because you know it's going to change time. You know, definitely this Easter weekend has ruined a lot of people's plans. I think a lot of people were looking forward to Easter Monday, the fixture. That's the fixture mm. everyone looks forward to because uh, all the kids are off school. People who don't live in Ipswich, they come and travel. They probably stay over and book a hotel, but then a lot of plans have changed. Um, but yeah, sometimes these curses do get in the way. Sometimes when you look for a game, you go, oh God, here we go We're on Sky. Or a team out of form, just like Rotherham. And as Stu said, come along, Itchwich, and um, we, we'll give you the win. But um, hopefully McKenna's changing that. And um, as Stu said about big crowds, yeah, normally when the expectations are high, we normally fail because our players don't get up for it. Um, but hopefully our players will get up for it and they'll be on TV looking forward to it. And also we want to revenge the Barrow telly game. That's the last time. I think that's the only time we've been on telly this season. Um, and that was horrendous. Um, so hopefully it will change this weekend. Kieran McKenna watched that game on on TV. He'd uh, he'd verbally agreed to be Ipswich Town manager at, right, at that yeah. stage, and then he's he's he said he's, he got a phone call from his dad that night and family members to say, "Are you sure you want to be Ipswich <laughs> Town manager?" Because <laughs> they were so bad at Barrow, weren't they? But um, he was a man of his word, and uh, thank goodness he was. I mean, we, I'm not, it, we talk about the TV curse. I mean, Carl Fuller, who writes a column for us at the East Anglia Daily Times, good friend of ours and KOA, a friend. Uh, he's done a lot on the TV curse. I think he's got, I think he's actually kept record right back to goodness knows when, back to when the, you know, goodness, back in the 80s, whenever they first started. And uh, and it is right. It is incredible. Like, it seems unbelievable. You just have a dread that it's just not, it's just become a thing, hasn't it? And Oh, I don't know. I can't even. I can't even remember a really good TV performance. There probably has been one, but I can't really remember. Probably at Wembley 2000. But we're all there then. Did you have to watch on telly, did we? So anyway, all right then, Stu. Well, that's that. Stu. Well, that's a, um, a little bit of team news, Stu, because obviously Mr. Burgess is, is suspended after his um he's double yellow, which I thought was a bit harsh on uh, like the other week. So Elvin Baggett. Did you? Baggett. Did you well, think I, that was harsh? I, I thought. Well, he, well. People make such a thing of things these days. Football has become very sort of, you've only got to get your foot about four inches off the ground and people roll around as though they've sort of, I mean, to be fair, the goalie didn't roll around that much, but, oh, I don't know. I thought... Mm, you no complaints from me. I thought that was that was a bit of a daft one, yeah. to be honest. I think uh, that was, was a centre-half in a, in a position that he wasn't used to being in the pitch. Mm. Um, yeah, the still image of his face sort of uh, contorted as he launched himself in from... From quite a distance, studs up. No, no complaints from me on that one. This is silly boy. Mm. Do you see what I mean, Ross? How I get put in my place sometimes when I, I say something, and then Mr. Watson. Yeah, no, he doesn't. That's quite. No, no, no. Quite right too. He's. No, he's, Mark, he's, he's you're the not the only man. one. No, it's, it's everyone's entitled to opinions. I think Mark. <laughs> Mark said that he, he thought it was a bit soft, and uh, you know, so you know, it doesn't mean that one opinion's worth more than the other, but. You, you thought it was, I mean, McKenna said the ref could have got away with maybe not giving him the, the second yellow because, mm. you, you know, the intent is obviously just to block the, the clearance from, from the goalie. But don't give the referee a decision to make would, mm. would be my uh, my take on that. When I saw the, I don't know if any of you saw the uh, the Atletico Madrid and Man City game, um, but I mean, if you, anybody did and saw the challenges that are going on in there for just the odd yellow, it's extraordinary compared with Burgess's attempt there. But anyway, that's by the by because what it has I, done... Just oh. on Man City, yes. um, a big Phil Foden, football IQ, rolling himself back on the pitch at the end <laughs> when he's taking the ball to the corner. He, he makes the most of a, a lunging tackle on him. No, don't, it's, a, it's a good tackle, actually. He jumps out the way. But then he... I mean, this is shithousery of the highest order, isn't it? He's, <laughs> he, he makes sure he rolls around for a bit and then he thinks, oh, I'm off the pitch. So he, he he does a couple more rolls to get himself back on the field. Um, yeah, I, in a strange way, I quite like seeing that from an English player. And I never thought I'd, I'd say that. But at times, how many times have we said English players need to kind of join the party on that in, in terms of the dark arts a little bit? And uh, I thought, 
I thought that was quite clever, really. It's the sort of thing you absolutely hate when the opposition do it to you, but um, it's it's clever. It's streetwise when when your team do it. I think Felipe gave him a whack up the arse as well on his second. Right, so he, ta he tackled him hard with his right foot, then whacked him up the arse with his left foot. So that's what I think Foden thought. Right, sod that. I'm getting back yeah. on the pitch. Did you see it? Did you see it, Ross? Have you seen it? Have you seen? It? Yeah, I did. It was oh, it was crazy. I know <laughs> it's a bit <laughs> massive game for Atletico Madrid, but they were just they're fugs, weren't they? Really, that's why you got to call them fugs. But uh, yeah, interesting viewing for the final. I, I tell you what, though. I mean, as much as they are sort of. Yeah, they're in the mould of Simeone and the the defensive, and they but they can play a bit as well. Yeah, I mean they had not many teams have City on the ropes like they did in those final twenty minutes. You thought they've got to, they've got to, you know, what were we how deep deep into two legs, and you think they barely had an attack, and then suddenly they just then they came at City and uh, they were holding on a bit, weren't they? But um, there you go. There's something about, there's something about Atletico Madrid that you sort of. You, you, you hate to admit it, but you sort of admire it. And I don't quite know what it is because the, the, the football is so aggressive and so in your face. And Simone, of course, I was young. I just remember Simone kicking David Beckham in the, in the, in the World Cup and, and, you know, getting him sent off and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, it's it, 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 they, they typify their manager. And, you know, their fans, though, must absolutely love it. They must absolutely love it because they're not interested in what sort of how they behave and the, the passion with it, which that team plays, whether rightly or wrongly, you know, we talk about, we've talked about, you know, we play Rotherham and then along come Ipswich Town and that type of thing. Wouldn't be, you know, I'm not saying you want to see Ipswich Town go around kick, of course, of course you don't, but just having that, uh, that sort of aggression and in your face. Yeah, type and, and you get different, you get different styles in football and I hate all this, there's, there's a right way to play the game. There's different yes. ways to play the game and you play to your strengths of the players that you've got available and Kieran McKenna is playing to the strengths of, of the team of the, mm. the squad that he's inherited, but I'm sure he'll be very aware that there is a, there has been a formula in recent years and, and Rotherham, uh, Wickham, that show you that you can be in the mix playing a certain way in League One. Mm. I just think, I'm not saying it's which need to completely go down that route. They're not going to. We know how they're going to play under Kieran McKenna. They're going to want to press high, dominate the ball, create chances, score the type of goals that we're seeing through sort of good play to the byline, pulling the ball back, etc. But you just need to have a, a couple of other strings to your bow, I think, that uh, on these games where we talked about the fine margins where a set piece can get you out of jail, where sometimes a shot from 30 yards, as we saw for Shrewsbury last weekend, can can get yeah. you out of jail. And I'd just like to see it switch, just add a little bit more variety to their game that are going to add those extra few points over the course of 46 games. All right, very quickly, just finish off on that Champions League, because we're not here to talk about Champions League, we're talking about Ipswich Town, but just very quickly then, uh, Roscoe, uh, I'll just say, uh, Simone, Guardiola or Klopp, who would you like, as who would be your man? Um, oh, That's a tough one, three very good managers. I'm going to go on Klopp, I like You're him. Klopp man? Klopp man. Steve Klopp. Uh, yeah, I probably would say Klopp, actually. Although I feel like I should say Simeone because he feels like he's more my my type of guy. Yeah. That's the sort yeah. of if it, exactly. as a manager, if I'm if I'm playing, he'd be the manager I'd want to play for. Exactly, Simeone I'm the same. I'm, I'm a Simeone man all day long. He's he's my sort of player. But anyway, that's by the by. Anyway, let's get back to Ipswich Town. Let's get back to their trip to Rotherham, of course. And we talked about start this 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 aggressive football start because of Burgess. When I said I didn't think it was yelling Stu being the chief football writer because he is the chief and he's in charge of all football chief opinions. And and he and he told me that he thought it wasn't. And we're all he's but it's very good, Stu. Part I've now changed my mind and it. It was a yellow and he should be sent off but anyway, that's why the point. So, but that allows mr baggett maybe an opportunity Stu. you spoke to kieran mckenna yesterday and um his name was mentioned i believe yeah provide someone with an opportunity whether it's elkin baggett we shall find out at half past 11 tomorrow um mckenna very tight-lipped on that obviously burgess now serves a one one game ban um edmondson out for the season, probably. So the door is ajar. Does he first thing is does he stick with the back three? You would think so because it's been back three ever since he's come in, and it would it would involve quite a reshuffle to to change to a back four. But the only thing he did talk in very vague terms about we've considered everything in terms of systems and personnel, and it might have just been a throwaway line, but. 
hard to know what Rotherham are going to do because a big stick being used to beat Paul Warren up in Rotherham at the moment that is he's stuck too rigidly to his system, which is three at the back. And it seems to be the feeling among the Rotherham fans, judging by social media, is that he needs to change to a back four and he needs to change something. And I think that's in McKenna's mind. And Ipswich have struggled a little bit against back fours. They haven't played back fours very much. So maybe the circumstances might lead him to experiment with that and maybe just have a little look at it ahead of next season. I don't know. I'd say that's unlikely. So if we if we go on the basis that it is a back three, it's then really a straight choice between Elkin Baggett, who you mentioned, or Dominic Thompson, who um, we've all known as a, as, as a left wing back during his time at Ipswich so far. He's more of a left back. He's played left back for, for Brentford, but he came on and played sort of left side of that back three last weekend because... Baggett wasn't on the bench. So um, it will be one of those two if it's a straight swap. Um, who, who would uh, who would you Ross. prefer? Ross, well, is Ross is shaking Ross. his head at the thought Ross, of Dominic Ross Thompson. Is, Ross is, Ross is sh- you're absolutely right, Stu. I mean, and shaking his head at the chief football writer. Really quite extraordinary scenes here on the on the YouTube video if you're watching it. I mean, I can't believe it's happening. But no, um, yeah, Ross, you, you shook your head there when, when Stu mentioned Dominic Thompson. I, th- I thought, I mean, I've seen Dominic Thompson a few times. He's done a right, but I suppose you'll talk about him in a back three, are you? Yeah, yeah. He's done okay at left back or left wing back, but him in a, a front or, you know, back three just doesn't work well. You can sort of say he was at fault for the goal at Shrewsbury because he may missed out on the header and their player had an absolute weldy of a strike. But um, I just don't. I think he'll get out muscled from this Rotherham side. So I think why not play Alkin? Alkin's a big boy. Um, I'm sure he's just waiting for that moment to play. He's been training with you know the first team for probably most of this season. So I think he's probably wanting to just get a chance to play. And I think maybe why not just chuck him in for this game? He is quite a str- he's quite a big lad. He's quite a strong player. He's quite a- I've seen him a couple of times in the under twenty threes. He's a he's a big lad. I think that Excellent might as well. That might edge it for him. The fact that Rotherham have got Michael Smith up front, mm. big big dominant in the air. That that his height at six foot four, um, and he's left footed as well, which means that, you oh. know I think he has played in the middle of a back three for the under twenty threes. But he's he's left footed, so he could come in on that left side of a of a back three. Um, might just tip it in his in his favour. Um, whether then Thompson comes in on the left for Matt Penny, who I don't think there's there was a, been a lot between them. Penny came in and was was okay last weekend. Nothing, nothing. I don't think we learned anything new about Matt Penny. He's uh, I think he's a better crosser of the ball um, than Dominic Thompson, but I would say defensively is probably weaker. So maybe Thompson is the more pragmatic option against a, a Rotherham side that can cause you some problems. Um, that would be my guess that, that it's a Baggett, Baggett comes in into the defence and we'll see Thompson back on the left side. Let me talk about the, the front man, Ross. Uh, Mr Norwood got himself another goal. Um, it does, he's, you know, it's, it's just it's a continual tricky one, this up front. It's a what, what's going to happen? What do you think is going to happen at, at Rotherham? Is, is, is Norwood going to get another shout? I mean, I suppose people would say no reason why not. He scored and stuff, but... What do you do? Do you give Pig a, a little run for the last few games? No reason why you particularly will do, I suppose. And Bond seems to be right out of the equation right now. So, what do you think? Wow, well, well, Pig is not even coming off the bench at the moment. So, that's a, an interesting one. I think um, we, we found out if we cross the ball, we can score goals. You know, Norwood has a great header. I thought it was a good goal on last Saturday. Um, a lot of people will be, you know, saying, you know, it is now dead rubbers pretty much. Do you just play Piggott just to see how he gets on for the final few games? But then do you still play Norwood just to see if he can earn that right for that that option on his contract? You know, loan players, you know, do you play Bond? But Bond, no goals in 20 plus games now. He's, he's lacking confidence completely. Um, but when you play a team like Rotherham, you want someone dirty, really. Um, and you want someone with dark heart. So Norwood would be my shout. Why not? It's, 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 Stuart, it's been a bit of an odd one, hasn't it? This striker situation. At the start of the season, we're scoring goals like they're going to have, like they're going to have, like they're Easter eggs, you know, like they're like the cream eggs, you know, we can't one after another. And now we just, we're now talking about strikers and we're all sort of show scratching our heads. Well, who would you play? Because no one seems to really, if Norwood scores a goal, we're all sort of like, wow, well, we've got a striker who scores a goal. Um, it's a bit of a funny one, isn't it, Stu? I mean, where would you go with this tomorrow? And well, over the Easter weekend, really, of course, we've got Wigan on Tuesday. 
go with Norwood again. I think he's he's played quite well in the, the last three games. There's a reason that McKenna kept sort of rotating it is no one was taking their chance. And I think he's proven that even though Norwood hadn't scored in the previous two, I thought his performances were pretty good judging by, you know, considering the lack of service that he was getting. I think he's he's worked hard and um last weekend was a reminder that, that I think he is the best goal scorer at the club. His his career stats prove that. I just don't know long term whether he fits into the McKenna system. I just mm. think he's a bit too off the cuff, is what I'd describe James Norwood as. And um if you just say to him stay between the the width of the box and concentrate on getting on the end of of crosses and, and scoring goals, then that'd be great. But he, sometimes he gets a bit frustrated when the service isn't coming. You, you find him dropping deeper and running into areas that you don't necessarily want him to run. But um, out of the three strikers that you mentioned, I'd, I'd be inclined to give, you know, stick with Norwood for a bit of a run now and see if uh, make, and then you can make a really informed decision as to whether he's going to be part of your, your striker unit going into next season. Right. Now we're going to do we're going to do we're going to do millionaire picks a little later on in the in the podcast because I mean a, f- a fantastic um, feature that is, and um, we'll be able to I'll be able to bring you up to date with how much money we've got actually. Um, but I, so we'll do that. But we sometimes talk about the scoreline at that point. We're not going to do that then. We'll change. Yes, we're going to mix things up because Easter, you see. So I'm feeling a little bit sort of frivolous. I think frivolous is a good word, Stu. Do you like that word, frivolous? Good word. I like it. Mm, thought you would. And so they are frivolous is a good word. And I'm going to now ask for score lines. We're going to have a score prediction this very second. Halfway through the podcast, how extraordinary that we're going to suddenly just mix it all up and have a score line half. I'm going to go 2 2. There we go, Roscoe. That's my prediction for tomorrow. 2 2. Um, and Ross, yourself. And um, by the way, I'm picking you up tomorrow, Ross. Don't be late because I will go without you because I just do not have time for people who are not on time. So just get there. I'm sorry. This is just di- digesting, di- digesting, diversifying a little bit on the pod, but I thought I'd just point that out. Uh, Ross, a score line, please. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for a draw as well. I think the um, TV curse will continue, um, but we won't lose. It'll be a nice 1 1 draw. Excellent. Good. Well done, Ross. And, and Stu, well, how, do you, how do you, what's your little thought process? Uh, I've also got a draw. I've also got 1-1 one, one in mind. Now, it's extra. now that, you see, you would have think, anyone watching this would think they've all had a chat before beforehand and they sort of all got together and said, shall we all say a draw? But we didn't, did we? We didn't at all because because Stuart got us up at half past six this morning to do this. So we're all up so early, we didn't really know what, what we were doing and what was happening. So three draws then. So three draws. So it's guaranteed everybody not to be a draw. So you can be sure of that because we've just said it'll be three draws. Um, all right, Stu, well, that's it then. So that's, that's Rotherham talking. Um, let's move on to something I, I want to just a little chat with you, Stu, about because um, a lot of fans obviously don't go, don't, see Kira McKenna's press conference as such you know you you do it on zoom call with him and obviously you've you know there's a lot of off the record stuff as well as on the record stuff we're not asking you to do off the record stuff obviously but I mean you've obviously seen him since well since that week before the Barrow game when obviously at the time he's thinking oh great what a team to take over this is but now he's settled in how do you how do you think how do you how are you finding Kira McKenna you know just 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 in the press just when you guys are chatting to him he's is he cut? Is he, is he the person that the, the fans see at the end of a game, quite calm and relaxed, and whatever happens? Yeah, very, very consistent. We keep, we keep hearing phrase about sort of him being very methodical and logical, um, very consistent in his his demeanour, and I think he's um, still remaining very open uh, in the way that he um, talks about the games. Um, that's the thing that struck me this week, actually, where he was talking about Rotherham. He'd obviously been down to, to Portsmouth, which is not unusual for managers to, to travel long distances to scout the opposition team. But he was talking about recently how much he'd watched. He said, we've watched a lot of Rotherham and we watched a lot of their games in the championship as well. And you think, wow, he's he must be watching a lot of football. If he's, he's had to go through all the tapes of, I'd love to know how much just how much football he's watching. Because he's I don't know how far back he'll have gone in Ipswich games. Imagine he's watched all of them this season before he even took the job, but I'd love to know quite how much further back he's gone in watching Ipswich. But if he's talking about we've watched, he said, I've watched a lot of Shrewsbury. I've watched a lot of their games over the last couple of months. And he's had to really, you know, he's gone from preparing Manchester United for Champions League games and watching the elite, elite end of football and he's watching a lot of football around Europe to suddenly having to fully immerse himself in the world of League One and the lower leagues, and it sounds like he he really has 
done. So um, that that sort of made me sort of stop and think that he was talking about. We've watched a lot. We watched a lot of Rotherham in the Championship. Now he wouldn't have been doing that while he was Manchester United assistant manager. Right. So he's done that recently. So that's that's a real deep dive. It shows you that he's already thinking about what's required when you get to the championship and when you can get to the championship as well. So, um, yeah, he's, he's very, uh, very relaxed. Um, I think anyone who watched or attended the fans forum will, will know that he's, um, what, what he's all about. He's just, uh, he's very, very calm, very calm. And I think that, that hopefully sort of spreads to the, to the players as well. Fans have taken to him, Ross, haven't they? I mean, even, you know, when the results haven't been great, you don't, you get one or two people sort of, mm, you know, keeps the same sort of, but overall, that's a very small minority. The majority of fans you speak to after the game, before games, um, are well on side with him, aren't they, and what he's trying to do? Yeah, very much so. Like, just his interviews, I think everyone learns something new about football sometimes. Sometimes some of the things he comes out with of what he's seen and what he's learned from the game, um, even just pre-match, you know, he always comes out with the right things. Uh, you know, we're still in the honeymoon period, of course, because we've not had that that bad run of form just yet. I know we've had a few bad results, as you said, but I think a lot of fans just like this new exciting um, progression that we've had under him because, yeah, we've had previous managers who would just say the, the typical manager quotes, but Mick Kenner's coming out and he's been honest. And uh, I think a lot of fans just looking forward to next season where he's going to have a full season, a full transfer window to bring in his own players, bring identity to his squad again. And um, yeah, a lot of positives about Kieran McKenna. Must be, I'll speak to a friend of mine today, uh, this week um, who was saying he's renewed his season ticket and um, without, 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 without hesitation on the basis of the football he's seeing and the entertainment he's getting um, since McKenna's taken over. See, it's not, see, it is a results driven business. Of course it is, but people do like to be entertained and they're feeling they're getting that at Porn Road, which is a good thing. Um, now that's great. Now, look, I hope you enjoy the Kings Vanguard podcast here this Easter weekend, myself, uh, Mike, Mike, uh, Mike Bacon, and also I'm with, I'm with Mr. Watson and, um, and young Roscoe, Roscoe at Ross Media UK. We don't really know what that means because that's not his name. He's actually called Ross Halls, but underneath his little black thing on his um, video, he's got at Ross Media UK, which I don't know what that means, but anyway, that's, that's nice. So we're all here, Chavez, we're looking forward to our, we're looking forward to our Easter eggs as well, I think. I've, I've mentioned it a few times, but I'm quite, I mean, Stu, uh, I'm so, we, we'll, we'll get back on the full, but I mean, Easter egg, I mean, I, I, I just love them. I mean, I just, Cabbage cream eggs are my favourites. So but about yourself, are you, what's what's your favourite little tipple when it comes to an Easter egg? Mini eggs. Ah. Can't, can't beat mini eggs. Yeah. A little crispy on the outside and, and a little crunchy in the, a little crunch on the outside and then, yeah. You, you can't suck them though, can you? That's the only thing I don't like. You can't sort of because they sort of like don't make that noise please oh. not on a podcast oh sorry <laughs> but anyway you can't you can't do that though can you because you have to crunch them don't you you have to bite them mini eggs yeah. yes michael you do thank you <laughs> you Got do have to out. crunch a mini egg right yeah. roscoe now it's no good you laughing roscoe but you've got a pile of them stuck behind you along with your one hot cross bun i've got you've got about 14 <laughs> easter eggs in the background there haven't you i've already eaten two yeah, um, and they're, they're my they're my two gone as well. I haven't got any more. So you're going to buy me an Easter egg for tomorrow's trip, Mike? Oh, you, well, you see, you see, you mate. Well, just have mucked it up there. Perhaps I was going to surprise oh. you with one. You see, I don't. Know, I think I will now, since you're expecting me to bring you one. I might, but I'll see what I can come up with. But um, yes, yeah, so there we go. Um, well, look, my um, wife makes a uh, she makes a dessert, um, very luxurious, out of half an Easter egg filled with sort of cheesecake in in the middle. Oh, um, so a bit, a bit of sort of biscuit base, sort of nestled in the bottom of half the Easter egg, then filled up with the cheesecake, and then some some mini eggs on the top. Oh wow, that is, that is special. That's calorific, but it's good. Calorifically good. That is fantastic. Um, you, could you make could you make me one? Let me just ask. Which is which is made them all now? I suppose She's done them all. I'll I'll put in a request. Okay, yeah. put in a request. Yeah, lovely, lovely lady Stuart Watson's wife. That's like I'm sure she'll I'm sure she'll make me one. She he asks nicely, but I know he won't ask. So doesn't really matter. Anyway, so um, right now let's move on. Now Roscoe, little question for you here. And one of our our goalkeeper, Mister Um Cladgley, is on the move. Maybe. Um, which I suppose you will be delighted about. You've got to say his name, but what, what's the situation? What, what's the what was the little story around this this week? Um, that Mr. Watts or Mr. Warren broke about him maybe going to Aberdeen. Is it? Yeah, um, a return back to Scotland because of course he had a, had a spell with St. Mirren in Scotland. Um, of course, he, he was signed as first choice under Paul Cook, but um, Walton came in deadline day and he's been unbelievable. Of course, we got him permanently, and um, I'm sure this man. Václav Holadky, 
of course, would want to uh, want to be playing because last year he was unbelievable for Salford, and um, sadly Walton's been why well, not sadly because Walton's been incredible. Um, but sitting on the bench and probably at an age where he wants to be playing for that club, Lanky, or whatever his name is. What's um, his name again? Just, just play it again so we can just, so we know okay. who he wants. Yeah. We've had Mike. Otslav Holadgi. That's the man. She sounds, she sounds drunk. Mike, <laughs> you, I enjoyed you rebuking Ross for getting the name wrong when you, you've, you, you're you not the best at pronunciations, are you? Let's be honest. You've added a G in. Ross has got an N, stuck an N in there somewhere. We've got Halaji, Halanki. It's not that many letters, boys. Come on. No. Do, you notice, do you notice I passed it over to Ross very quickly with a Halanji? Just like that. So <laughs> okay, yeah. I, I didn't really want to actually say that I fell with them. But um, yeah, well, yes, well, there you go. Well, that's uh, well, he may be on. Hopefully for both of you that he does leave. Um, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't an Andy Warren story. It was a story that came from, from the Scottish record up, up north of the border. Um, Aberdeen interested so uh, Ross is right he's 31 years of age he's his career was very much on an upward trajectory he hasn't come here to be to sit on the bench uh from Ipswich's point of view they've probably got a very nice uh backup option to Christian Walton and he may want to leave but he's got two years left on a contract is someone gonna offer the same sort of money that he's on here at Ipswich, that, that will be something that he has to maybe take into account. Am I going to take a pay cut to play football? And then from an Ipswich point of view, how easy is it to go and sign a backup goalkeeper? It's mm. not very easy to persuade someone to come here because you can't go, well, you might get your chance. Anyone coming here knows that Christian Walton's going to play mm. bar injury every game next season. So that that's a tough sell. Certainly people go, I'll just go and get a Premier League loan player as a backup goalkeeper. Well, Premier League clubs aren't going to loan you someone to come and sit on your bench in League One for a season. So um there there are a few things that go into the mix on that one, but it, it wouldn't sh- it wouldn't shock me if uh Halaki just says, look, I want to go and play and, and they, they come to some sort of an agreement. But we'll see. I think it's a difficult position goalkeeper. It's always fair. apart from people always say goalies are mad. I mean maybe they are, but it's also such a it's the only position on the pitch they play is that they don't have I mean you get out, outfield players can can play different positions. You, you're either in or you're out. There's no in between. When you sit on that bench, you know na- you might be named in the squad, named on the bench. How many times the goalies come off the bench? How many football matches this weekend will a goalie come off the bench and get get minutes? You could probably go through all the games in the, in from Premier League data, and no, none, nobody will, will come on. So very difficult. He probably wants to play. I hope he, you know, I, I, if he wants to play, good for him. If he takes a pay cut, and wants to play, whatever he does, good for him. Um, we're at the best. We'll have to see what happens. Maybe we should get goalkeepers should sort of focus on adding training in another position to give themselves that that chance. I'd like to see like a goalkeeper really specialise in being sort of a a goalkeeper slash striker. Like in the old days, you'd have a centre half that turned into strikers, like. Yeah, or vice versa. So you mean like then, Christian Walton? So like if 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 like Wes Burns goes down with a groin, <laughs> like the, the the ball goes up and Walton, 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 that we bring our reserve goalie on and put him in goal. Walton goes on the right wing, or 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 actually maybe what's his name? Yeah, I was on the is on the bench. He comes on the right wing. So we actually bring a goalie right. on for a yeah, winger. Right wing would be interesting. I was thinking yeah. more just a target man. You know, do you remember <laughs> yeah. when? Um, yeah, David James. David oh, James. Yeah, played up front for Man City. Just someone, that, yeah, specialises. They're a goalkeeper slash target man, and they're very much a bench player throughout the season. But to maximise their chances of playing, they're someone that you bring on just maybe in the 89th minute, just when you want to go route one, get the ball. Like Thomas Holy. Get yourself Ooh, trained. As, get, he said he played as an outfielder in his youth. Train yourself as a target man, just yeah. just to create a bit of chaos. I mean, he's not well, a great look, example because he, he doesn't he doesn't use his physicality particularly well. But just but just at, a thought there. Look at Edison. I mean, he hits the ball a mile. I mean, he could easily come on as as your you know if you get a free kick or something. Just bring it. Just bring him on centre mid for the last twenty minutes. Then he had free kicks out, so he could just take and bring it and put your reserve keeper in goal. I mean, these goalies oh. these days play football like no no one's business. I mean, back when I used to watch football as goalkeepers, all I could do was hoof it or pick it up. They didn't do nothing else. Now they dribble around centre forwards and off they go at the corner flag, a, a keepy uppy, boot it down the field. They what level do you think Edison could play outfield? What level? Comfortably, yeah. Oh, he, he could play easy championship. Easy. Reckon. Yes. Of course he could. If he, he was left, he could play left back for any championship side. Or why, left, why, left, why left back? Because he's left footed. Okay. 
and he played like he could be like a Dominic Thompson type. In fact, he could. In fact, that'd be a good signing for McKenna. Go to the <laughs> go to Man City and say we want Edison as a as a left 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 wing attacking left winger type thing. See what Edison says. We could probably match his money. What do you think, Ross? Yes. I think yeah. squad is coming together. We've got Michael Michael Nottingham in midfield from Accrington, and we've got Edison at left back. Just got a few more pieces of the jigsaw to land now. <laughs> well, look, there's well, why not? I mean, who knows? You, you have to be positive in this day and age. You can you always always look for things. The football's evolving all the time. You never know what's going to happen next. Gold is up front. That will be the next. I like thing. this. If you don't ask, you don't get. That that would right. be your route. You'd just be <laughs> just be ringing up Pep and and Jurgen yeah. every every five minutes. Can we have Edison at left back? No, no. Okay, fine. Uh, <laughs> Mendy, I mean, Mendy's another goalie. I mean, Chelsea keeper, be, he'd be another, he'd be another fine winger. I bet you, I bet you, if you put him on the left wing somewhere, so we've got a choice of keepers there. But anyway, that's by the by, we, we're digressing rather. Um, right, um, one person who's um, all talk about people leaving, staying, or going, or wherever they're going. I'm, I'm still here, and uh, you're still here, Stu. Obviously, and Roscoe, you're still here. Um, but Leo Neal is not here anymore. Ipswich Town, Stu. Um, he left the club this week. Um, you, you knew Lee quite, Lee quite well, didn't you? For the, for the few years he was here. Yeah, just just through sort of speak, interviewing him and speaking to him through through work things, and I would echo what a lot of other people have said that I found him a, a thoroughly pleasant, nice guy to to deal with, Lee. And it kind of saddened me a little bit to sort of see some of the responses to him leaving. And I know it's kind of guilty by association to a, an era that Ipswich were were in a bit of a a bad place and a real funk and and I feel like he was almost sort of guilty by association really mm. he became a bit of a a human shield for for Marcus Evans was put in some pretty unfair situations I kind of think back to when um was it after Lambert got fired and then I don't know why but he got put forward to do an interview uh the following day and the takeover stuff was very much sort of rumbling and was clear he's going to get asked about that. I mean, Lee would have known exactly what was happening yeah. with that takeover, but had to kind of give the politicians answer. And no, we haven't we haven't selected our manager yet. And then the next day, I think you know, literally less than twenty four hours later, Paul Cook got got hired. I mean, if you can't say anything, don't get put forward to do the interview in the first place. And and there were other examples. I just felt like he was asked to do a very difficult job in difficult circumstances was just you look at how many people Ipswich are now adding to their backroom team mm. and Leo Neal was trying to do the jobs of all of those people yeah. I mean a prime example is I remember him Andy and I were leaving the ground quite late on on a Saturday uh having sort of finished all our work and Lee was pulling his suitcase up the main drive and we sort of looking looking quite sort of tired and frazzled and sort of said, oh, where are you off to? Oh, I've got to fly to Sweden now to go and watch Harry Wright play in a lone spell. And then and I think Ross at times had seen him where he sort of watched the men's team and then stayed overnight to watch the women's team the next day. And he was just trying to do everything. Um, so it's a man who's ultimately given 20 odd years service to the club as a player and in various different roles. And I think it's only right that people should should wish him well when whatever happens next. Your thoughts, Ross? You agree with that? I mean, it's you know, he was a man who 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 did seem to do a lot a lot for the club. Yeah, so many different roles, and you know, no, he had a massive title, didn't he? Football manager operations and academy manager, and loads of different names. And as Stu said, you know, he he did do those travel and you know going to all those games. He was up up at Newcastle this season for the women's team for the FA Cup tie for him to go travel up all that way. I'm sure he would have done something on the Saturday as well for him to travel up that way. And he's done, he goes and goes to the men's game and go to the women's game, stay, staying over. I'm sure he's, his wife's probably more happier now that he's not going to be doing that. Um, I'm sure whatever job he does next, he'll do a fantastic job in. And um, yeah, some people have criticised him, but what can he do when he's doing like three or four different jobs at once? You just can't do that. And, You've seen Mark Ashton, he's brought in his staff now and they're probably doing a lot of Leo Neal's roles, just one person doing that role instead of just me doing four roles. So I think um, we've got to appreciate Lee for what he's done and um, we wish him luck for what he does next. Do you think Ross fans over worry about backroom staff and stuff or were they really I mean I mean we we sort of make stories about it and the club obviously about, and do fans sort of are they really into it all who's doing what I mean if you asked a fan 
if you ask are fans really into the backroom staff is it important to them i think they do in a way i think they would like to know who does what because i remember there was a question at the fans forum um the first one when paul cook was in charge and i think one a lady sort of questioned can you let us know what all these people in black track suits do because there's loads of them there's loads of them behind the dugouts and i think some people go there's like five six of them but what do they do and i think some people are just interested of like what does that bloke do what does he do you know what, what is their role so i think they are interested definitely now i think nowadays everything's on social media everything is there to be seen people just want to know who does what so um yeah a lot of people are interested in that sort of stuff i think football is guilty of becoming far too manager centric now and i've said this before that you see every game now is is kind of it's Mourinho versus Klopp and it's a press conference with the manager every 24, 48 hours, it feels like. And there are so many people involved in football clubs now. It would be nice to hear more from them, you know, semi-regularly. Um, and I've spoken to Gary Probert, who's the new director of football operations, who's who's essentially the new Leo Neil. And that, that interview will be coming out next week. And we'd, we'd like to, and I've said to the club, we'd like to do more with with some of these these backroom staff, just just so fans can kind of know who's who's involved in the club now. It can't just be Mark Ashton and, and Kieran McKenna talking every time because this is this is a team effort and these these people all have vital roles to play. So hopefully we can uh, we can bring you some more of those over over the course of the next the next few months heading into next season. There's certainly a lot more backroom staff there used to be when I uh, back back in the uh, in the Bobby Robson era. I think mm. it used to be him and Bobby and Cyril Lee, and that was about it. I think. And um, now nowadays you've got sort of hundreds. I mean, going back to the Atletico Madrid Man City game again. I mean, the the technical areas. There was more people in technical areas than there was in one of the stands. But I mean, that's uh, that's the way football is. But as Stu says, that's right. People they have all got roles to play, and it, it's all part of the of the game today. And um, yeah, I mean, some that's yeah, yeah, these people have got important roles. It would be nice to know a bit more about them and and what they do. So, uh, well, look, um, we come. I hope you enjoy the podcast here this Easter. This I keep saying it's Easter. It's Good Friday, Stu. I mean, do, do, Good Friday is that Easter? Well, it is Easter, isn't it? I suppose it's the first day. Of, it's it's Easter. So. Um, yeah, so uh, I like my. You see, sometimes Speedway on Good Friday, Stu. I'm, a bit, I'm all over the place this Easter. Usually, there's a Speedway meeting Good Friday, and there, there isn't one now. The, the Witch has lost last night, and now you've got there's no football either. I mean, at least, at least football replaced it. I thought, well, that's good. That's not even. That's not even here this Good Friday, Stu. We're all over the place, aren't we? I don't know about you. I am. I'm, doesn't take much though for me to be all over the place. But that's not really <laughs> there you go. Um, right. Okay. Um, now. We must talk about millionaire picks. I know that I know Andy's not here, and I know whatever happens, he'll be cross. But I don't care. As far as I'm concerned, there's money. He has a lot of money still. He's not telling us, but there's still hundreds of thousands of there that he still has, and he's going to pretend money. But I'm not so sure it is. Now, let's have a few millionaire picks for this week for this game against Rotherham Stew. I'm sure you can um, think of one or two. And have you we got any idea how much money is left in the pot? Was this discussed in the podcast earlier in the week, Ross? Do you know? Uh, I can't remember. I know it's not. I think maybe it's like half a million left, maybe, something yeah. like that. Didn't he put quite a big bet on last time? Didn't yeah. he go quite large on something? But I don't know. I can't remember what it was. Mm, I'm not so sure. He had, he had a he, he was a bit cross with us all that we lost lots of money the last time I was I was hosting the podcast. But I don't care. I I'll think be honest. This has been an absolute shambles of a feature. It's yeah. just un, unravelled as the weeks have, have gone by. Mm. Um, but let's let's go with it. Let's do our usual, just sort of carefree stick. Why do you say it's carefree, Stu? I mean, for me, I th I've thought a lot about this. I've only, I didn't sleep very well last night thinking about what my millionaire pick was going to be. So, okay. I, I, yes, I've put a bit of thought into this. Um, but anyway, Ro Ross, have you got... I, 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 do you want me to... Start? I'll tell you what mine is then, shall I? Yeah, I'll, please do. Mine. Okay. Well, my millionaire pick this week is for there to be... I'm going to put 50,000 because I want to put 100,000, honestly, last time and I was told I wasn't allowed. Well, you told me, actually, Stuart, as Chief Football Writer, you sort of, you know, you said to mm. me, that's just being silly, and and probably it was. So I, I'm back to fifty thousand, and I'm going to go for at least four goals, right, and an Ipswich win. You predicted a two-two draw earlier. Ah, yes, yes, BC. That's no, yes, I did. But that was me. Just see, I'm. I, I like to have lots. I like to have lots of. Lots of things on the plate, Stu. If I have a ploughman's, which we had mm. when we played golf the other week, didn't we, the other night? I had a nice ploughman's. I like to have lots of bits of food on there. I can't just do the one thing. So I've covered lots of bases there. So if it's 2-2, two, two, I can say, mm. I said 2-2. Two, two. 
And if it's like 3-1 to Ipswich, which I think mm. it might be as well, I've won money. That's my bet. Okay. Ipswich to win and at least four goals. Do you know what odds that is? A lot, I would suggest. Good. <laughs> I would suggest a lot. That is why this Easter time, I'm going to bring some money back into the big pot. Excellent. Ross, over to you. You try and match that. Um, why not? Elkin Baggett, the score on his league debut. Per <laughs> nice. Well, you, per you laugh. Ross, I don't know why you find that so amusing. That's the sort of thing I should have thought of. Really, absolutely brilliant. Up, up absolutely he comes. Brilliant. Set piece. Bang. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course that's it'll be voided. Because, it'll be voided funny, if he doesn't play. Of course, so no, it's not. That's funny, Ross. You should say that because this week I've been speaking to Jason Dazelle about the 30-year anniversary of the Division Two winning team in '92, uh, and of course Jason scored on his debut, and of course Andre scored on his debut. So the Baggett on his debut, Mr. Baggett on his debut. If he does have one, what a what a great shout that would be. Baggett to bag. Yeah, we'll take that. that. That's a good heading, Stu. Well, I don't think we'll remember, we'll remember that one. Bag at the bag at bags the winner. Uh, I will put my money, however much money we're allowed, fifty thousand. Don't even yes. know if we've got this much left in the pot. Fifty thousand on Rotherham to score from a set piece. Well, that's a I don't... given. Honestly, well. <laughs> that's, that's that's probably about six to one on. You're not going to make mm. anything off that. Have another for, one. For all the talk about their big their big physical threat in the air, it's the delivery that worries me. Bar laser, I mentioned him earlier. That's what Ipswich are lacking at the moment. Someone who can really whip in some some dangerous dead ball deliveries. I think Connor Chaplin stuck a free kick into the uh into the knees of the wall in the latter stages last weekend, kind of summed up Ipswich's set piece woes. It's got to the stage now where the fans are are uh, chanting in jest, we're gonna score from a corner. That's not great, look, is it? When your own fans are taking taking the Mickey out of your your uh, lack of threat from set pieces, but um, we we also have overlooked that they've conceded a few from set pieces as well. Oxford obviously scored late on, didn't they? From from one, so both both attacking and defending set pieces needs to improve. I think that's something they really need to work on. McKenna's well aware of it as well. Mm, that's true very true well, well let, let's hope Stu I mean let's hope more than anything that you're you lose your money let's hope you lose all your money mm. on that. let's hope so let's hope you have nothing left at the end you've you've lost everything because you gambled on that yeah and our, our, I have won a fortune yeah and I'm completely destitute and uh I have to live in my car exactly and if I do win of course I will be able to put petrol in the car to come home if we can find a garage so, yeah, fill yeah. that car up today, please. I don't want to be driving around Ipswich at seven o'clock tomorrow morning, finding somewhere that's got got petrol. Well, I, well, I, I, I might do actually, Stu, but I am actually, I'm actually, I will do because I'm looking for Easter eggs today as well. So I'm, I'm on an Easter egg hunt as well today. So I'm doing one down at Felixstowe, and then I'm coming back. So I'll be driving past a few garages and see if I can find it. Is it, is our, is our car diesel or petrol, um, Stu? Do you know that the Jazz is it diesel or petrol? Because diesel's the one's a problem, isn't it? It's petrol. We should be okay. Should be okay. All right. So, well, anyway, well, my, my son's car is actually from back. He's here back from uni. I can siphon off his. Um, he's got quite a lot in there. I'll siphon off his if he's uh, if he if he's not around. So, um, we'll have plenty. Don't worry. Um, look, we come to the end of the Kings of Anglia podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to it, Kings of Anglia family and friends. Um, and you know, well, unfortunately, no, Mr. Mr. Heath is not here, obviously, and nor, nor the Hutch Warren. They're both off. I don't know where they are. Really, so when they just suddenly just they just suddenly just go, don't they? Do they just say you 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 know we're not here? So it's just us. It's us three, and here we are. We're all going up to Rotherham tomorrow. Ross, as I said before, don't be late because. I will go without you. I do a tardiness. Tardiness is not something I can can put up with. Okay, I'll make sure to be on time and ready to go. And what happened last time we went to the Speedway press conference? And I said, "Will you be there on time? Were you there on time?" Mm, no, no, you weren't. Right. So anyway, so hopefully you will be, and we'll look forward to uh, having another podcast next week. Stu, I look forward to catching up with you uh, tomorrow. Uh, likewise, friend. I'll see you in the morning. Exactly. Well, thank you. For, so this this, this has been uh, uh, Mike the La Porca de la de la Poncho de la Pork de la Pork de la Cream Egg. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, uh, podcast. I just say a little a little a final farewell from from the Roscoe. The Roscoe set your alarm at Ross Media UK. Roscoe. I shall. I look forward to seeing you bright and early on Saturday.
Exactly. And also finding from from the from the chief, from the chief himself, the chief man, the chief man, the chief, chief man, um, chief can. And don't forget Manscaped, 20 percent off Manscaped, 20 percent off our sponsors, Manscaped. You must. I'll, I never forget to mention them. Manscaped, 20 percent off. <laughs> For if you want to shave your bits and pieces, they I think they're, they're renewed. They're renewed. Art. They're sponsored. Wonderful. I've, I've actually got a little nose trimmer. I don't have a told this last. I don't trim my nose. And I believe you, you're doing your ears as well. We're trimmed everything. We have trimmed every single thing in the <laughs> KOA, KOA family. Manscaped.com. Twenty percent off. You put KOA in there. Uh, as I said, hope you enjoy the podcast, and we'll see you again after 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 we've beaten Rotherham. See you later. <laughs>